There being none, we shall move on. Senators, on the 25th of August, I informed the Senate of the death on the 16th of June of John Joseph Madigan, a senator for the state of Victoria from 2011 to 2016. In a somewhat broken year, it's been some delay until we can address this, but I'd like to welcome it. His family, who are attending in the chamber today, who are now able to attend due to the lifting of travel restrictions from our home state of Victoria. I call the Leader of the Government and the Senate. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Senator John Madigan. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 16 June 2020 of Mr John Joseph Madigan, former Senator for Victoria, and places on record its appreciation for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Earlier this year, I, along with other senators, was shocked and saddened to learn of the passing of former Senator John Manigan. Elected as the first senator for the Democratic Labor Party in 37 years, John was a humble and down-to-earth blacksmith and boilermaker from Ballarat who fought to improve the lives of the average Australian. Born on July 21, 1966, in Melbourne, John was one of four children to John and Patricia Madigan. Growing up in the Melbourne suburbs, John's interest in the blacksmith trade started at an early age. He would reminisce around age eight or nine, during his paper round in the suburb of Caulfield, he would stop and watch Bernie Dingle, a local coach builder, wheelwright, blacksmith and horseshoer at work. Mesmerised by what he saw, John would return to watch night after night, the flying of the sparks intriguing the young John who, recognising that coach building, wheel writing and blacksmithing were dying trades, turned his attention to welding and boiler making instead. His fascination with the trade led him to Newport TAFE, where he undertook an apprenticeship in structural steel fabrication. From the Victorian railways to his own blacksmith's forge at Hepburn Springs in the central Victorian highlands, John spent 28 years working as a blacksmith and boiler maker. Becoming a politician was not something that was on John's list of things to do, but during his childhood, politics was never too far away. He grew up in what he called a DLP family and, as a young boy, handed out how to vote cards for the DLP. In 2006, John became a member of the DLP and, a few years later, after being persuaded by DLP old believers and his wife, Teresa, he decided to run as a Senate candidate in the 2010 federal election. It is safe to say, Mr President, that John's election in 2020 to the Senate came as a surprise to many. He joked that at 11pm on election night, when the ABC's Anthony Green announced we appear to have a DLP senator, that many would have been searching the internet for a reference to this new and obscure group, he said. DLP was, of course, far from being new or obscure. In July 2011, he entered this chamber as the first DLP senator since 1974. John referred to himself as the most outside of outsiders, a tradesman and a member for the DLP, an oddity and a leper. They were his words. But he was a strong supporter of the manufacturing sector, true to his values and a voice for Australian workers and farmers in his community. Throughout his time in the Senate, John remained connected to his original trade as a blacksmith and boilermaker. He would load up one of his many beloved one-tonny youths with his portable forge, and he would give blacksmithing demonstrations at primary schools across Victoria. He was perhaps one of the most practical examples of constituent and electorate engagement that any member of this place has ever given in reaching out to schools and communities. It was a lot of work, but John gained enormous satisfaction from connecting particularly with young people. Many people, he said, would laugh at this and ask, what's the point? Blacksmithing is a dead craft. To which John responded, and I quote, but that's not the point. I do it because I hope it gives young people hope. It's about showing them they can do practical stuff with their hands. 
It's about engaging with our next generation of community leaders. I have particularly fond memories of spending a day with John in rural Victoria around his beloved Ballarat, visiting a local school uh, and seeing a program designed to engage young people in trades and the passionate conversations had with John about those issues. Travelling on to visit Ballarat Business Gecko Systems together, uh, in which uh, we talked about the engineering processes, the manufacturing opportunities that a company like that was delivering in supplying equipment to mineral processing businesses and the policies necessary to support further manufacturing activity. John indeed started the Australian Manufacturing and Farming Program to help narrow the divide between politicians and working Australians. His advocacy to me and the trip that he took me on was an example of his willingness to bridge those gaps wherever he could. The aim of the program was to give politicians the opportunity to visit factories and farms and to get a better understanding of our industries and the lives who, of those who work there. He launched the program in late 2011 with former Senator Nick Xenophon and the Honourable Bob Catter MP, the three amigos, as Bob would often refer to themselves as. In 2015, during an appearance on the ABC's Q&A program, John referred in his passionate argument for Australian manufacturing to submarines as being the spaceships of the sea. This reference gave John an almost cultish following for a period of time, for those who may recall the various uh, images and indeed I think even T-shirts that were spawned from that reference. In 2015, after troubles within the DLP, John decided to start his own political party, John Madigan's Manufacturing and Farming Party. However, it would last only briefly until the 2016 election when, after six years in this place, John would retire from politics. During his time in the Senate, John was committed to advocating for those Australians who felt their voice had been lost. Known for his determination to do the right thing, John stood for what he believed in, no matter what it cost him personally. Asked what he wanted to achieve during his time in Parliament, John said, and I quote, "'All I worry about at the end of the day is being true to myself, true to my family, and friends and putting my head on the pillow at night and when I leave Parliament, whenever that may be, that I will walk out with my friends, my family and my faith intact. John achieved that. Faith was incredibly important to John. He was a devout Catholic whose faith inspired others to be better and to do better. It was a tragedy that at age 53, John was taken from us and particularly from his loved ones far too soon after a battle with cancer. He leaves his wife, Teresa, and two children, Lucy and Jack, who, along with his mother-in-law, Carmel, are here with us today to pay tribute and to celebrate John's life and achievements. We thank you for doing so. We thank you for the patience in waiting to be able to be here in this troubled year. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian Senate, I extend to you, John's loved ones, and all those who cared for him, our sincerest condolences and our gratitude for sharing with him and with, the, with us and with the nation. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of John Joseph Madigan, former senator uh, who passed away so young at 53. And I start by conveying on behalf of the opposition and my personal condolences and sympathies to his family and friends. And I welcome them, the members of his family uh, who are here today with us. I don't think John Mad Madigan would mind me say, remind, sorry, I don't think John Madigan would mind me saying he reminded us of a different time. A blacksmith by trade who represented the Democratic Labor Party in this place. A party that had ridden, risen to prominence under the guidance, guidance of activists Bob Santa Maria in the ni in 1950s and had lost its last Senate seat in 1974. I hadn't even arrived in Australia, Mr President. Yet Mr Madigan served in the Senate in the second decade of the 21st century. 
He did so grounded in the values that had endured from his early life and that had been borne out in his career, and from these he never wavered. His family said in a statement following his death, he was a generous and compassionate man who gave his life to the greater good and had great faith in the people of Australia. He considered his time in Parliament a privilege, and he sought always to discharge his duty to all Victorians, regardless of their political persuasion. In addition to this generosity and compassion, John Madigan showed great respect to others, respect to colleagues, even when we disagreed, and respect to this institution something I appreciated in him greatly, even on those occasions where we were not in agreement. John Madigan did not adopt the DLP. He was born into it. He grew up in a loyally DLP family in Melbourne, and he joined a youth group run by BA Santa Maria. Prior to his entry into the parliament, Mr Madigan completed an apprenticeship in structural steel fabrication and worked as a blacksmith and boilermaker from 1983 to 2011. And as my colleague Senator Birmingham has said, this was a choice of trade which came about after being fascinated by a local blacksmith in his youth. He undertook his apprenticeship and then worked for a decade in the Victorian Railways, where he was also a proud member of the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, or the metal workers as we colloquially recall it. Following this, he relocated to the town of Hepburn Springs uh, in the central Victorian Highlands, and there he set up his own business in the same trade and lived there with his wife Teresa and their children Lucy and Jack, who are here with us today. It's also where he passed away. Before his election, John Madigan held senior leadership roles inside the DLP, vice president of the state branch in Victoria from 2008 to 2009, and then its president from 2009. He also became, in the same year, vice president of the federal DLP. Of course, he served one term as a senator for Victoria, being elected in 2010, commencing office in July 2011, and then being defeated at the general election in 2016. Of the re-emergence of his party in federal politics, he joked that it had been a long time between drinks. I suppose as a teetotaler himself, he had the patience to bite his time. From the outset, John Madigan sought to give voice to workers, to families, to farmers and small businesses with whom he engaged. He felt many had been alienated by decisions of successive governments in the opening up of the Australian economy to the world. In this vein, John Madigan's commitment to manufacturing was a constant theme throughout his time in the Senate, and he consistently returned to it, grounded in his own personal experience. He argued that the great economies of the world have strong manufacturing bases, and he wanted to see government do to doing more, much more, to support and invest in Australian manufacturing. Uh, this is a principle we in the Australian Labor Party agree with, although at times we would differ from Senator, former Senator Madigan on how this might be achieved. He advocated for the re-establishment of worker and farmer cooperatives and for strengthening regional banks and credit unions as a first step in revitalising regional Australia, accompanied by a commitment to decentralising our industries and the public sector. And one area of local manufacturing about which he was particular, particularly passionate was shipbuilding. And I recall in 2015 him asking questions of the then Deputy Leader of Government in this place, Senator Brandis, about the failure of the Abbott government to commit to the development of our local shipbuilding industry through a local build of Australia's future submarines. In asking Senator Brandis whether he would also commit to purchasing an Australian-made T-shirt he was holding in support of Australian manufacturing jobs and charities, Mr Madigan made the following quote, following comment. Minister, Two of the things I believe in are that a country is what a country makes and that submarines are the spaceships for the ocean. Not only was submarines are spaceships for the ocean perhaps his most memorable quote in his time as a senator. The slogan first came to light in an episode of Q&A earlier in the year and even made it onto T-shirts itself. But this statement went to the heart of his philosophy because that a country is what a country makes was foundational to Mr Madigan's political ideology. For the record, Mr. Senator Bra former Senator Brandis replied that he would proudly advocate for Australian industry, including by wearing such a fetching gar garment, but I don't think he followed through on that commitment. Mr Madigan was also a vociferous opponent of free trade. 
Now, this was something on which he and I were out of step, but I am prepared to acknowledge that on this he had views which were not completely friendless within the Australian Labor Party. But whilst I didn't agree with his views on these issues, I was respected he wanted the same outcome that I also sought, a fair and prosperous life for working Australians. His commitment to fairness went beyond the material conditions of working people and included refugees who sought asylum in this country, as well as multicultural communities who were discriminated against. So whilst he was an economic nationalist, he did not sound a jingoistic or racist bell. Despite being a member of the crossbench for whom committee positions are harder to come by, Don Madigan served on many committees, including joint, the Joint Statutory Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, and chaired the uh, perhaps very famous Senate Select Committee on Wind Turbines. His sincerity and passion for those who found his committee to be an important outlet for their grievances was not doubted. Mr Madigan finished his service as an independent senator, having fallen out with others in the DLP in 2014 and, as Senator Birmingham said, formed his own party, launching the John Madigan Manufacturing and Farming Party, in which he sought to tap into the increasing discontent amongst voters, particularly in rural and regional areas, about the mainstream parties. He sought to give greater prominence to farmers and manufacturers as the backbone of the Australian economy. And this echoed the commitments he made in his first speech when he spoke of his desire to represent Australians who felt that they had lost their voice and that no politician from either side of the fence gave a damn, to use his words, Mr President, about their future or the future of their families and communities. However, this new political venture wasn't sufficient to return him in the 2016 election, and there his journey as an elected member of the Australian Parliament ended. And I understand, after briefly joining the Country Party, he was recently welcomed back, back into the DLP, which seems fitting for the, for the prominent role it played in his upbringing and his political career. John Joseph Madigan was a man of strong convictions, and this meant we didn't always agree. For on, is on issues from trade policy to marriage equality, we would find ourselves on opposite sides of the argument. But, as I acknowledged in the debate on the recognition of foreign marriages for same-sex couples bill in 2013, Mr Madigan contributed his views in a respectful way. Following his father's passing, his son Jack Madigan sent me a moving note sharing his own and his father's reflections, and I want to thank Jack. At a time of his own grieving, it was a distinctly generous act and displayed a dignity and kindness that would have made his father proud. John Joseph Madigan was a genuine man. He was a decent man and he was an authentic man. And perhaps most of all, he was true to himself, which is the aspiration all of us in this place should have. So I again, on behalf of the opposition, express my sympathy and condolences following his passing uh, to his family and friends. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise to offer the Australian Greens' condolence to John's family, and um, in particular uh, his wife Theresa and children Lucy and Jack. And um, uh, John, I think, in this place. Um, created um, a wonderful opportunity for many of us who worked with him uh, to confront some of our, our own ideas of issues and to talk about uh, ways in which we could find common connection. Um, I was going to reference the um, um, quote in relation to submarines being the spaceships of the ocean that um, Senator Birmingham and Senator Wong have. Um, but I, uh, you know, and while that one may have made it onto T-shirts, the phrase that I often heard John say uh, in the work that I did with him was he would say that Jesus was a refugee. And over and over again in the work that we did collectively on um, finding a, a fairer and more compassionate approach to refugees in this country, um, John was steadfast in his conviction for compassion. Uh, and his faith. And, um, he would often say, um, don't forget, Sarah, Jesus was a refugee. Um, his ability to um, listen, uh, to take stock of advice and then to very calmly 
put his position, whether it was in support or in opposition of the person he was speaking with or negotiating with, I think um, is testament to his strength of character. And there are many, many issues that uh, John Madigan and I um, disagreed on, uh, from uh, reproductive rights uh, to marriage equality to many others. Uh, but we found a common goal when it came to uh, immigration policy and human rights. Uh, we often talked about the issues of Tibet. We often talked about uh, the issues of refugees and asylum seekers and would find uh, common ground by which we could work together on. Um, both Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham have referenced his absolute commitment to the manufacturing sector and the um, passion that he had for Australia to make things again. And I think um, he was ahead of his time in many ways in relation um, to, to those issues, while harking from, uh, harking from the past actually being very clear about saying there is a massive gap here. Uh, in Australia, and we had to get on it. And I think this um, year, in particular, has proven um, we haven't. Perhaps, if we'd taken a bit more advice uh, from John, um, we would have been making a few more things here um, in the midst of uh, this COVID pandemic. Um, this chamber and this workplace forces us to be oppositional with each other. Uh, it is the battle of ideas. It is, the, um, it, it, it is where uh, we have the contest uh, of policy and where we have passion, uh, uh, passionate debates about our convictions. Um, all of my engagements with John Madigan were respectful, uh, thoughtful uh, and honest. Um, John was no pretender. He was, a, he was a real person, uh, and you, what he said is what uh, he'd do, and what you saw is what you'd get. And he was very, um, in some respects, sometimes in this crazy world of politics, that is indeed incredibly refreshing. Um, I would often find myself sitting in John's office talking about a particular motion or an amendment that was coming up and um, struck by his incredible calmness of dealing with things, particularly at a period like this, often at the end of a sitting period when the list of bills are stocking up and you know, the government's threatening gags and you know, sitting hours, and you'd walk into John's office. It was always dark. It was always a bit the, the lights were down, and it was just this instant calmness. Nothing seemed to throw him into a tiz. As, um, uh, often in this place, particularly when the pressure is on, you, we all know can happen. Um, so sometimes it was nice just to pop into his office and to have a bit of a breather. Um, I always appreciated the time he gave me and many others in this place uh, to, to explain to him the position that we were coming from and uh, the reasons why we were asking for his support. Um, he was, as I said, always respectful. In fact, uh, he, was an in, in, he was nothing but a gentleman in this place, and I think um, uh, everyone would, would accept that. He didn't tolerate bad behaviour, and if he didn't think you'd behaved well, um, you know, he'd say it, and he'd say it to your face pretty bluntly, and I always appreciated that. Um, his former staff member, Chloe Preston, still speaks very fondly of uh, John. Um, we've had a number of chats about uh, the time that she worked in his office. She now works for Senator Wish Wilson. So um, I think a bit of those conversations about trade and, uh, and fair and free trade have probably um, uh, flowed through. But Chloe, I know she's not here today, um, but was incredibly saddened by uh, John's passing. And um, I just want uh, his family to know that uh, she thought that he was a wonderful boss and she learnt a lot from him. Um, so uh, again, uh, extend uh, the condolences of, of the Greens and, and myself personally to John's family. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I stand on behalf of the National Party to offer our condolences and sincere sympathies to Theresa, Lucy, and Jack. 
uh, on the passing of their much-loved husband and father, former Senator John Madigan. Very few people who pass through this place manage to do so without attracting a few enemies, but not John Madigan. It's been acknowledged here today, and you've heard from all the raft and range of uh, political ideologies uh, that John was a very fine representative for our home state of Victoria, a hard-working, decent man who always put service above self. And if only we could all aspire to uh, live that reality in our work as senators. John won the sixth and last Victorian Senate seat at the 2010 federal election, becoming the first DLP senator to serve in more than three decades. He was among three rookie Victorian senators who took office on 1 July in 2011, former Greens uh, senator Di Natale and myself. And I also remember the evening of John's maiden speech as sen former Senator Edwards and I warmed the crowd up in the afternoon. But John spoke about uh, what he, his work um, forging pinch bars for Munro engineering post drivers. And he spoke of Australia's anti-dumping policy and Australian jobs, the economy and rebuilding our industry. And he did that in 2011. And how realistic and pertinent uh, are those themes to us in a post-COVID-19 uh, recovery uh, era that we're entering? These are all issues of significance. Um, I recall one occasion that John rightly said in this place, the strength of our manufacturing sector is directly related to the strength of our job market. Could have been Blackjack McEwen uh, uttering those words as uh, Senator Madigan. And it's obviously a view that we in the national share. If someone has a job, they have a sense of self-worth, they can provide for their family and contribute to their broader community. Senator Madigan made a lot of sense of the time, as do most who hail, I might say, from regional Victoria. In April 2016, late in the evening during adjournment, uh, John spoke passionately about the impact that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was having on farming communities, particularly, again, in northern, north central Victoria. He said the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was one of the largest negative impactors on our farming communities in the history of our country. And he said our basin communities in Australia were on the precipice of a national water crisis. How very true. John was a person who was prepared to back up his words with action. And in 2015, he set up John Madigan's Manufacturing and Farming Party. As someone elected to represent the party of farmers and entrepreneurs uh, leading rural and regional manufacturing. This is a significant milestone in John's political career. And on many, many issues, and, and others have mentioned them, decentralisation uh, amongst them, um, banking issues and the like, uh, Senator Madigan and the Nationals were on the same page, particularly about sharing a passion for agriculture and manufacturing. He always spoke the, about the importance of trades and the fact that Australian manufacturing was not on its knees. He said we need to work towards enhancing the competitive advantage of Australian industry and not allowing other countries to benefit at our expense through us supplying them with cheap energy at the expense of our manufacturers and food processors. I recall that speech because he spoke of manufacturing businesses in places like Wodonga, Wilson's Transformers and Steely for, inst Sealy for instance. And he talked about the Australian Manufacturing and Farming Program industry showcase at Wodonga TAFE and of a Manufacturing Meets Parliament event. I think we also shared our import, important views around regional media, the role of the ABC in regional communities, um, and we needed the ABC to not just have a regional presence but a regional voice in, in their city boardrooms. John and the Nationals were on the same page when it came to sticking up for our great, efficient, clean, green food producers. And he was one of the great advocates and champions of buying local, buying Australian and supporting local manufacturing and local producers. Um, and again, spoke very, very strongly during the debate on food labelling in March 2015. In fact, during that very debate, my Nationals colleague and Deputy Leader Senator Canavan paid tribute to John's advocacy for better food labelling to benefit Australia's farm sector. So to my class of 2000 colleague, uh, former Senator John Manigan, you made a valuable contribution to our nation. 
The National Party in the Senate uh, was honoured to have worked with you, and I know there are former senators from our party, O'Sullivan and uh, Wacker Williams in particular, who really enjoyed uh, going into battle with John on a variety of issues that I'm sure my colleagues will touch on. We're very proud to acknowledge an honest, hard-working blacksmith from Hepburn Springs who stood up for manufacturing, farming and family in regional Australia. Condolences to family and friends. Barley, John. Senator Selger. Uh, thank you. And I, I wanted to briefly associate myself with the very fine words uh, that have been put on the record today in the chamber uh, in relation to uh, John Madigan. And I wanted to uh, offer my condolences uh, to his family, uh, particularly, of course, to Theresa, to Lucy and Jack, to Carmel uh, and to other loved ones uh, who uh, miss John Madigan. Now, we've heard a lot about uh, John Madigan being a, perhaps, uh, as Senator Wong said, uh, perhaps a man uh, who represented another time uh, in some ways, uh, and I think she meant that in a very good way uh, in terms of uh, some of those values that he represented and some of the issues that he stood up for. And I won't go over uh, those things, except to say that, of course, the DLP have been a very significant part of Australian political history, and of course, John will uh, forever have a legacy as someone who, at least for a period of time, uh, resurrected uh, the DLP, as has been mentioned many, many years after uh, they would have been thought uh, to perhaps never uh, grace this place. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, apart from uh, the you know, reflecting on. Uh, John's background as a blacksmith and boilermaker, as has been done, I, I want to really deliver a, a bit more of a personal message to uh, his family in just the time I got to know him and the character uh, that I saw. And um, John was a man who loved his family, he loved his country uh, and his community, uh, his state. He was a man of deep personal faith and personal conviction. Uh, and he was prepared to stand up uh, for those personal convictions, even uh, when they were unpopular. Uh, and he was prepared to advocate uh, for them. He was hardworking, he was authentic, honest, uh, passionate, decent. Uh, a gentleman sums him up, uh, a good man. Uh, and I think that uh, to his family, uh, those are the legacy items uh, that, of which you can be most proud. Of all of the other things that he achieved in his extensive career, both pre-politics and, and in this place, uh, it is his fundamental sense of decency uh, that you can be, I believe, most proud of. Now, Senator Wong mentioned his great respect for the institution of the Senate, and I certainly saw that, and I think that was deeply held. He and I used to um, rage together often against the Greens. Uh, and he, uh, he would have a lot of arguments with the Greens, although notwithstanding that Senator Hanson Young has talked about some areas where they had uh, a fair degree of agreement on. But he would rage against the Greens. But in his respect for th this place, I remember him uh, sort of in hushed tones sometimes coming and raging particular about the Greens. And it was a couple of uh, particular senators in the Greens who he was completely shocked that they would come into this place not wearing a tie. Uh, and I, I, I point again to Senator McKim, who's backing up the case. And I remember him saying, how, how, can they, how can they come into this place and not wear a tie? And so when I would occasionally walk into this place without a tie, I was always a bit sheepish. And I would hope that John uh, was not looking unfavourably at me as he was at my Greens colleagues. Uh, but that deep respect for the institution uh, was deeply held and it was reflected uh, in everything he did. Uh, the way he treated people was a reflection of who he was. And whether you were on his side in an argument or whether you were on the opposite side, uh, he always acted with great respect to you as an individual. Um, it was put in the DLP official obituary, and uh, I'll just extract a small amount because I did see uh, this, and I think it sums up uh, a lot of what John stood for. Um, it said here, and it was the DLP uh, official obituary from uh, Stephen Campbell, he said, John stood for the unborn child, for the unemployed, for the refugee. The little guy in every sense was John's major concern. Uh, can I say to the Senate, can I say to his family that that 
uh, will forever be his legacy. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that in, in coming years uh, the family will be able to reflect on that enduring legacy. Uh, I thank you uh, on our nation's behalf for his service to our, to our country uh, and to this chamber. Uh, and uh, may he rest in peace. Senator Betts. On the 16th of June this year, Australia lost one of its quintessential sons, a family man, a hard worker, a man of faith, a man of values, of timeless values, might I add, and a man of courage. John Joseph Madigan, a Victorian senator for too short a period, was all those things and a lot more. With former Senator Madigan, what you saw is what you got. Sincerity, believability and a desire to be a genuine servant leader within his community. No manoeuvrings or duplicitous agendas for John. He either agreed or disagreed with a general proposition at stake. Willing to talk and accommodate on the mechanics, but not on the fundamental principles. Australian democracy should celebrate the fact that we had Senator Madigan grace the Senate. The blacksmith from Hepburn Springs came to the Senate and gave voice and expression to shared Australian values. Starting as an apprentice with Victorian Railways and a proud member of his union, he learned in the University of Life, bringing an earthy and realistic understanding of social justice and the requirements and expectations of our fellow Australians from government as, and as it develops public policy. Be it championing the sanctity of human life, manufacturing sustainability in Australia and concerns about China's human rights record, Senator Madigan was across the issues. His approach to his newfound and unexpected role as a senator was best summed up by himself in his first speech. He said, we are the representatives of the Australian people, not their masters." End of quote. For Senator Madigan, that statement was not just words but was meant with deep conviction as he conducted himself accordingly. Senator Madigan was the type of senator who had the potential of giving the Labor movement a good name. I observed that Senator Madigan's seat in the Senate was one that had been previously occupied by Senator Harradine. He was, by instinct, a Labor man. Senator Madigan did tell us, I have often said that the best government for Australia is a good Labor government and the worst is a bad Labor government. As can be imagined, I agreed with him 50 per cent of the time. <laughs> I first met Senator-elect Madigan in 2010 in an office in Melbourne attired as I am now, with Senator Madigan in work clothes, using someone's office where the senator-elect had quoted a blacksmithing job and was discussing details, and we used the coffee facilities to have a chat. His hands were calloused, like all those who work so hard to build and keep our country going. I last spoke with him to discuss what if any protocols applied for his funeral, knowing his life was coming to an end. But between his departure from the Senate and from this life, I had the pleasure to catch up with him for a coffee in Ballarat a couple of times with his family and a substantial number of telephone calls, always genuine, always concerned, always offering insights and suggestions. To his widow and children, some of us know the journey you've been through, the shock diagnosis, the battle to stay with loved ones, and yet the assurance of knowing a better place awaits. Whilst the Madigan family are listening from the splendour of the presidential gallery in this place, they know that their husband and father, who was an excellent servant of the people of Victoria, is listening from a gallery of exceptionally greater glory than in here. To Mrs Madigan, Teresa, Lucy and Jack and Carmel, 
Thanks for lending John Joseph Madigan, your father, your husband, your son-in-law, to the service of this nation. He did himself and yourself proud in his service. May he rest in peace and my condolences to you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I too would like to, to make some brief remarks in honouring the service of Senator John Madigan and uh, pay my condolences too to his family and friends. Uh, whenever uh, John was going to, to leave us uh, from this earth, it was going to be too soon, uh, especially given his contribution to many, uh, his family and friends and others, uh, but uh, his young age has meant that it's been far, far too soon uh, for us. Uh, he, he, made, he was an enormously generous and compassionate man. I only served with him for around a year in this Senate, uh, uh, but uh, 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 I got to know him a little, a little during a few inquiries, and I was struck with uh, how much work he did in his own community, uh, with his church, and how much his strong faith informed him to be so generous and compassionate to others, no matter what their backgrounds. He did uh, a stellar amount of work with young people, particularly interested in getting them interested in trades and other ventures. He helped overseas, I believe, uh, with charity, uh, and his contributions to this country and to his community uh, will probably uh, remain unrecognised in, in public view uh, because they were hidden uh, from the normal political processes. It is for those people that will feel the loss of John more than anyone else, but he's also been a great loss to the political fabric of this nation. He has gone too soon in political terms as well because, in some respects, uh, the time has shifted now to suit uh, John's principles and values. Uh, some have remarked here that he was a reminder of, of, of a previous time or a previous generation in Australia. I actually think he perhaps was a harbinger uh, of a new uh, and renewed uh, found emphasis on the need for this country to return to cherish its wealth producing industries of agriculture. Uh, of manufacturing, of mining, uh, and John was, a, was sometimes a lone champion uh, of those sectors, uh, a lone voice uh, for many uh, that did not have a speaker in this parliament. That was obviously informed by John's uh, own background uh, as someone who worked with his hands uh, and knew what it was like to feel the pride of making something of worth and value to others uh, with your own hands. And he wanted an Australia that did not forget the importance of actually making things uh, so that we can provide a service to others in our own community and to the world, uh, and of course also be in a position where we can uh, build the products to defend ourselves and protect our independence, like the spaceships of the ocean, uh, the submarines. Again, another example where John was well ahead of his time. We are now building uh, submarines in Adelaide, and now everyone is talking about manufacturing. Uh, everybody is talking about manufacturing. Uh, John was sometimes a lone voice on, on that particular cause a few years ago. Uh, he, John also took up unpopular causes in other areas as well. Uh, he was a champion of the unborn, uh, and I want to recognise the efforts he did in this chamber to bring forward uh, legislation to protect those rights. Uh, again, some, something that he was uh, criticised for, but in his own humble uh, and softly spoken way, he, he would proceed on uh, with his own convictions and principles on those matters, and uh, he's a great loss uh, for us in this chamber on those causes as well. I got to know John best, though, when he did chair the, uh, uh, the Senate Committee on, on, on Wind Farms and particularly their impact on local communities. Uh, John was a, an extremely grassroots politician. Uh, uh, he, 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 despite being an engineer, probably knew more about the technicalities of renewable energy than anyone else. But what most interested John was not uh, the mechanics of a wind turbine, uh, but the uh, impacts on, on human beings and their families of such industrial uh, developments. And so during this committee, we actually went and we spent a number, of a number of days going to people's own homes. I actually don't think I've been to a Senate committee where we've done the same sort of outreach. We actually went to people's homes. We went to their bedrooms, with their obviously with their permission, uh, and and saw how close they had to sleep to 
uh, very large, uh, noisy uh, things, uh, and heard their stories firsthand around their kitchen tables about how they were kept awake at night. Uh, some, some people had sold their own homes or moved uh, just to get away. And his tireless work bringing attention to that issue uh, has left the legacy of the National Wind Farm Commissioner, uh, uh, who I think is doing a good job to represent the interests of those who are impacted by very large developments, and they, more than anyone else, deserve to have their views heard, listened to and acted upon. Now, as I said, John is uh, a great loss for us because he was a, a voice for those that often don't have a speaker. He was a speaker for those who don't often have a voice. And, uh, uh, it'll be up to us now, those of us that share many of his philosophy and values, to amplify his message in the years to come, uh, which have become more relevant, I think, in recent years. So, despite John's passing, I hope it is of some assurance that his legacy, uh, his example, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his pioneering efforts in these fields uh, will continue to be built upon in this place, thanks to his, his efforts. And, uh, my great condolences go to, to all his family members, uh, uh, and I share with Senator Abetz uh, the strong view that uh, Senator Madigan is looking uh, down on upon us on, on these uh, proceedings, uh, and I hope we can live up to his example uh, and commitment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fierabanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. I too rise to pay my condolences on the passing of John Joseph Madigan who sadly left us at a very young age of 53. Uh, as a female conservative politician uh, in this place um, and having an office uh, close to John, I got the opportunity to get to know him uh, quite well and speak to him on quite a number of occasions about the things that were important um, to both of us. And as I reflected on his maiden speech of the 25th of August, uh, it was uh, 2011. It was about values of family and faith, um, and others have spoken about different parts and different things that he said during his maiden speech. But the thing that I really took uh, from that speech was: um, this is a man uh, whose background was about hard work, commitment, hard work and most importantly, a commitment to his family and to his faith. And those values and beliefs uh, underpinned what John uh, did uh, in this place. Uh, we've talked about manufacturing and, of course, in his maiden speech, he did talk about Blue Scope. And as a sen senator based in the Illawarra, uh, Blue Scope is very important in Australian and Australian steelmaking is very important. And, of course, we had occasion to discuss those things. Um, in an article uh, in the Canberra Times uh, following his passing, um, he's referred to uh, as um, a blacksmith, teetotaler, Democratic Labor Party senator. He's a throwback to another generation, a time when things were done differently. It wasn't that things were done differently. It was a set of values and beliefs um, that John shared and shared with uh, with us, but but that sense, uh, those sense of family values and beliefs that I think are still very important to the silent majority in this country, and which John so ably uh, represented. He was, um, as others have said, respectful, a good listener. His quiet manner uh, demonstrated his deep understanding of how our activities here affect uh, the daily lives of Australian um, families. But what I do want to say uh, in relation to John, uh, particularly when we do talk about values and beliefs, and we have had um, conversations uh, in recent times about politicians and, and conduct, uh, John always conducted himself with the utmost respect to everybody. He was, uh, as Sarah Hanson Young has said, he was a true gentleman. And as politicians, I think it's very important that we need to live up to the values and beliefs that we tell the electorate that we hold and that we promise to represent. And there should be no difference between who we are here in Canberra and the values and beliefs that we pronounce uh, to uh, our constituents and to the people that put us here. And I know uh, that John embodied very much the sentiment that he was a politician that said what he meant and meant what he said. He was a politician who abided by 
the courage of his convictions. And I know that in this place uh, that is often very, very difficult. But for John, it was who he was, uh, and that's what I admired uh, most about him. Uh, often, when you, do, when you are honest and forthright and you do stand up for your, uh, and have the courage of your own convictions, uh, it is and can be a very, very difficult, a difficult time, and it is a difficult place to be. But if you do um, have the strength of courage, as John did, uh, to do that, then it does make it very easy, and therefore he maintained um, the faith and trust that the electorate had placed uh, in him, and I think that that uh, is one of the things that we will very much um, remember about him. So can I say um, uh, to you in conclusion, um, to you, uh, Teresa, to your children, Lucy and Jack, uh, to Carmel and to the rest of your family, you should be very proud of his service both here and the service uh, to his community uh, out, both before and after uh, his time in this place. He was a decent, honest man, a man of enormous uh, integrity. And um, your father may not have been uh, to Jack and Lucy. He may not have been here a long time, but the values that he espoused of family and faith are the values and beliefs that live on in the silent majority in this country. Vale John Joseph Madigan. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. I too am very proud to rise to pay tribute to the late John Madigan. John was very proud of his blacksmith heritage. As we've heard in this condolence motion, he was humble and he was a gentleman. He led the Democratic Labor Party back from the wilderness winning the sixth Senate spot at the 2010 federal election. He was the first DLP senator to be elected since the defeat of Frank Vote Mac Back McManus and Jack Little in 1974. In his first speech, John Madigan himself quoted the expression, it's been a long time between drinks. He was very proud of his part in the re-emergence of the Democratic Labor Party, though of course, as we know, he quit the party in 2014 to start his own manufacturing and farming party. John spoke of his path to this place when only 12 months prior, he was forging pinch bars for Munro Engineering's post drivers. He paid tribute to the blacksmiths, foundrymen and wheelwrights of his childhood for revealing the skills and wonders of their craft to a wide-eyed young lad. I actually thought of John Madigan recently when I was at Sovereign Hill in Ballarat for the launch of their master plan, not far, of course, from where John died in Hepburn Springs, uh, with the support of some $10 million from the Morrison government, a grant to Sovereign Hill. Uh, Sovereign Hill is establishing a centre for rare arts and forgotten trades, the Craft Centre, which will be a major piece of the first stage of its 20-year master plan. And of course, this celebrates the trades which John held so dear. John was concerned about a lot of things in his community, uh, particularly about drugs. And he said and made this very clear over and over again that it was a scourge on our society, causing devastation on families and individuals and causing untold harm to our economy and our industries. John was passionate about manufacturing and farming and along with Bob Catter MP and former Senator Nick Xenophon, he formed what he described as the non-partisan Australian manufacturing and farming program. And it was actually in this context that I had some dealings with John when I was the former member for Corangamite. He was really focused on helping senators and members to gain a better appreciation for the men and women whose hard work keeps this nation running. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott described John 
as a very decent man with an old-fashioned sense of courtesy and respect. He served just one six-year term in the Senate, being defeated, of course, at the 2016 general election, but he made a very big impact and he made a very significant contribution and clearly, from what we have seen in this debate today, is remembered very fondly around the corridors of this parliament. I also want to convey my sincere condolences to John's wife, Teresa, and his children, Lucy and Jack, who paid tribute to their husband and father, saying, he was a generous and compassionate man who gave his life to the greater good and had great faith in the people of Australia. John died way too young, at the age of just 53. My dad died at 58, so I know for Lucy and Jack, this will leave a very big hole in your hearts and in your lives to have, lo to have lost your dad at such a young age. But all, is Australia, all of Australia has certainly lost a great gentleman in John Madigan. May he rest in peace. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I would just briefly like to add my remarks uh, in this condolence motion. Uh, as we have heard this afternoon, John Madigan was a man who was decent, authentic, humble, respect respectable, always a gentleman who expected the highest standard of others because he applied the highest standards in this place. He was a man who brought to this place great conviction. And while he was only here for six years, his, present has, his presence has been deeply felt. John Madigan came to this place with another important role, and that was as a staunch defender of our Australian constitution. I met, engaged with John, in working to defeat the Labor government's proposal to recognise local, uh, local government recognition in the constitution. Uh, John was part of a very, very small group of senators that argued against Labor's referendum bill, that voted against Labor's referendum bill, that put his name to the official no case against that referendum bill. And as some, as you, some of you might recall, the referendum was never put. The referendum had been defeated in the court of public opinion before Kevin Rudd put himself before the election, before the people in that vote. So John Madigan has come to this place, has made a tremendous contribution that I think is recognised in the remarks of so many people from across the chamber. Uh, for my part, uh, he helped preserve the constitution kept true to the idea of the federal compact between the states in making this Commonwealth. And for that, I know many, many Australians will be very, very deeply grateful. I also just add my condolences to his family uh, on your sad loss. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried, and I again acknowledge John Madigan's family who have travelled up from Ballarat um, to be here today and their patience in having this matter addressed by the Senate. I shall now proceed to the placing of business.